uh, I was going to say to be careful. If the brother tell you these things are on wheels, he's just putting bets down on wheels for the first one to go. And wishing it was me. Probably. You didn't say that. Yeah. <laughs> but I could feel it. Yeah. <laughs> Sierra, please come to order. Let's come to order, please. Please come in and sit down. Okay. Please take your seats. Town meeting members only within the enclosure, all guests and other folks upstairs. Everybody ready? You guys in the hall, in the aisles, please sit down. Welcome to the uh, 2011 town meeting, Arlington's annual town meeting. I'd like to um, have us all welcome the Monotomy Minutemen who are going to serenade us with the Star Spangled Banner and a couple songs. Join us to the national anthem.
very much. Um, for, for our invocation this evening, we're going to have Major Stephen Carroll. I'd like to have Mr. John Mark, former town council, come forward for introductions. Mr. Moderator, thank you. Uh, John Marr, uh, Precinct 14. It's my distinct pleasure tonight uh, as a member of town meeting and also as a member of the Arlington, Somerville, Cambridge Salvation Army Advisory Board to introduce to you tonight for the last time Major Steve Carroll. Steve has been the commanding officer of the Arlington, Somerville, Cambridge post uh, for 19 years and he has been, he's now in his 40th year with the Salvation Army. <laughs> People, when they think of the Salvation Army, they don't often think of the town of Arlington. But in point of fact, hundreds of people of the town of Arlington, in fact, thousands, over the years during Major Carroll's tenure has received services from uh, the Salvation Army on Mass Ave in Cambridge. Steve was instrumental in establishing the first licensed daycare center that exists in the Commonwealth and is called uh, um, uh, for homeless children. Uh, it is called... Uh, our place. Steve is overseeing uh, in his final days the uh, groundbreaking last week of a complete renovation in addition to the Cambridge uh, 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 Center. Uh, when you think of, as I say, when you think of Arlington, you don't necessarily think of the Salvation Army, but just a short distance away on Wellington Street, there is a place, a kind of a halfway house for uh, uh, men who have had uh, substance abuse problems. 119 men have graduated from that program and now currently there are 92, 92 of those 119 have established a permanent housing which they pay for themselves. In addition, uh, there is uh, a, a, at the Cambridge Center a uh, program called Bridging the Gap which is for troubled uh, youths. Uh, I would uh, also point out that the Cambridge Center in the, in la just last year has served over 123,000 meals to homeless individuals. Ladies and gentlemen, I would, it's my distinct pleasure. Uh, by the way, I just want to say one, one more thing. Uh, I serve on the board. There's many of you who have served or currently serve here, including Ed Choi from the Redevelopment Board, Joe Tulamary, former Re uh, Redevelopment Board, current chair of the Zoning Board of Appeals, Bill Shea of the Permanent Town Building Committee. Uh, it is my distinct pleasure to introduce to you for the last time before town meeting, Major Steve Carroll. Shall we pray? Our Heavenly Father, what a privilege is, it is mine to represent this uh, wonderful group of men and women before your throne. We know, Heavenly Father, that decisions don't come easy. We will wrestle, discuss, argue, reason, and come to some conclusions. We pray, Heavenly Father, that everything that happens this evening and throughout town meeting will be as such that it benefits all the people of Arlington, that you are glorified, that Arlington becomes and continues to be a place where business thrives, men and women and children live, and we all call Arlington home. Thank you for this group and thank you for all they accomplish on behalf of those who live and do business here. In your name we pray, amen. Thank you, Major Carroll, for your years and your years of service. Thank you to the Nevada Me Minutemen. I welcome you all to the 204th Annual Arlington Town Meeting. Pleasure to have you all back. As you'll notice, we have some new toys this year. 
We've gone from the um, Joshua Bell's efforts last year to a rear projection screen with a uh, projector in behind being run by Dave Good. That you'll notice in my letter I said if you want to have anything projected on the screen, this is what I was talking about and he's the guy you got to see. You've got to give it to him somehow, either on those little memory stick things or email it, get it to him as soon as you can so that he can make sure it'll show up nicely on our new screens. You'll also notice new timing devices. Um, <laughs> I'm keeping you guys honest. We're moving into the current age. These things are going to flash green when you start talking, yellow when you have three minutes left, and a real annoying red light and beep when you're done. <laughs> Hopefully, no one's going to get past the green light. Excuse me, the yellow light. The, um, old, the adage I've said before, three minutes is good, five, you're going to start losing us, seven minutes, we're going to vote against you, holds true, even though we have these. So let's keep our remarks concise and to the point. If someone else has said it once, just get up and say, I agree with him or her. Um, we don't have to have the same argument several times. Um, I've provided in the back at the assistant clerk's table little cards with my names, phone numbers, and emails. If you have any questions, please call me home at work during the day or email me. I'd rather deal with it before we get to the meeting than have some question of procedure or a uh, question of scope or something like that come up during the meeting so I can have some advance notice to, as to what you want and I can give you a good answer. That's also true if you have any questions of any of the um, department heads, boards, chairs, committees, or anything else, get in touch with them first so they can have our answers for us. Uh, more than once in the years past, people have asked questions they weren't prepared for because we're kind of blindsiding them. Um, this isn't gotcha politics. This is town meeting. We're trying to run a good, efficient town here. Let's let them know so they can give us some good answers right up on the first time around. Having said all that, I am going to swear in any new town meeting members, people who were first elected this year. Please rise. So you're going to repeat after me, sticking the, your name in where appropriate. Raise your right hand. Aye. Do solemnly swear that I will faithfully and impartially perform the duties. It's up there. Incumbent upon me as a town meeting member of the town of Arlington in accordance with the bylaws, Town Manager Act, and the general laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts, so help me God. Congratulations. Now, any town meeting members who are re-elected, please stand. That's you now, Mr. Tosca. <laughs> I was re-elected, so I have to say it too. Uh, please raise your right hand. Repeat after me. I, I John Leone, do solemnly, swear do solemnly swear that I will faithfully and impartially perform the duties incumbent upon me as a town meeting member of the town of Arlington in accordance with the bylaws Town Manager, Manager Act and the General Laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. The General Laws of the Commonwealth of Massachusetts. So help me God. Congratulations. <laughs> One last remark. Either turn them off or put them on vibrate. And please don't be texting during the meeting. If you got a text, go out in the hall. Um, a couple years ago, someone asked if they could Twitter during the meeting. He has dispensation to do that because he asked me beforehand. Otherwise, don't be texting your kids or your girlfriend or boyfriend or whatever and saying, I'm almost done, John's boring or something like this. Just, just kind of rude. Please don't do it. Um, I recognize the board of Chairman of the Board of Selectmen is Clarissa Rowe. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. And I believe there's some wonderful children who would like to come up to the front of the auditorium. These wonderful children and their PTOs are here tonight from the Dallin School, the Hardy School. You can move all the way over to that one. Um, and be in front of me so people can see you. Um, 
the Audison and the Bishop School, they've collected over $16,000 to give to our sister city. So I would like you all to please give them a hand. Thank you very much. And now I'd like to um, recognize the Vice Chair of the Board of Selectmen, Kevin Greeley. You all can stay right here. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Thank you, Madam Chairman. Just one point of clarification. Uh, Clarissa was using my notes, so it's, it's uh, my inaccuracy. Uh, they collected money, uh, monies on behalf of our sister city, but it's for the Japanese Relief Fund for uh, the devastation that occurred there. Luckily, Nagoka Kyo is in the southeast corner of uh, Japan and was not adversely affected, other than, of course, their fellow uh, country people. And, you know, it's wonderful tonight as we had the Minuteman here. It's a wonderful tradition. So is our sister city, a wonderful tradition. We're in our 28th year of that particular tradition. And we've also, for the last few years, had a student exchanges. So tonight, we have some very special guests with us who are here on a student exchange program. They will, of course, go to the Red Sox. They will, of course, do a whale watch. They are staying with Arlington families, and they'll do a lot of things at schools during this week. On Thursday, you're all invited to a cherry blossom festival at the Audison Middle School starting at 6.30 to 8, where many of these students will uh, perform some traditional dances for us. So let me first ask them to stand, if you would. Nice Arlington, welcome for our 20 students visiting from Nagoka, Kyo. <laughs> If you would please a nice warm welcome, just a couple of words of welcome from the head of the delegation, my honor to present Mr. Koji Hirayama. Thank you very much for your thoughtful and warm support. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, um, I stand here today to talk about the state of the town. Before I do that, I would welcome, I'd like to welcome my colleagues from the school committee who are here, Jeff, Cindy, Leba, um, Kersey, and Bill's hiding back in the, um, back there somewhere, there he is. Joe and Judson may be home for a reason, may they might be enjoying themselves a little bit more than we are tonight, but anyway, I, I really appreciate them being here. It's wonderful that we have two of you being town meeting members. It really makes a difference. And I'd also like to welcome Senator Ken Donnelly. If you would stand up, Ken. We really, really appreciate his, his being here. There may part, be parts of this speech that he doesn't particularly like, but we um, are great friends, and we may differ in our ideas of how we approach things, but he will always listen. And I'm very grateful for that. I stand here tonight with a very different speech from the one I gave in 2008. Then we were in the fourth year of, our, of the old five-year plan, and things were running very smoothly. I want to thank the people who developed the plan, 
for their forethought and care and for the stability that we've had for the last six years. Now is a different time. The recession has left us wary and frightened and mostly concerned about the future and our pocketbooks. The state of our town is still strong, but the state of local finances here and everywhere is very troubled. We can't look to the federal go government to help us. Congress has cut the community development block grants, block grant funding by 33% uh, this year. That funding has been our safety net for Arlington for decades, funding services for the elderly, for troubled youth, and for many programs and scholarships that have made a difference in the lives of the young, the old, and people with meager means. And state government can't help us either because it has its own looming deficits. Actually, there is one thing that the state can do, and I, add, I personally urge the good senator and our three representatives to do it, and that's to give the town the ability to put our town employees into the GIC or a health plan that brings comparable savings to the town while maintaining high quality benefits for our employees. I want to emphasize <laughs> I want to emphasize that this is not about asking our employees to accept inferior health insurance. It's about providing good health coverage without overpaying for it, which is what we're doing under the present system. This move seems drastic to many town employees who have benefited from generous benefits for years. Now, that being said, I must say that our, our employees are underpaid compared to surrounding communities, and they do an outstanding job for us with that little pay. I understand the fear of change. I understand the concern over loss of bargaining rights on this issue. But we really have no choice. We can't keep doing business the old way. If the cost of providing health insurance goes unchecked, we will lay off even more teachers, more fire firefighters, more police, and more DPW workers, and more t teachers, of course. We will lose the sense of Arlington that we, that we enjoy today. In my opinion, we have already cut too much. We need to think and spend in new ways. We want both sides to compromise, as is happening behind the scenes right now on a health package for the coming year. We need a partnership with our employees. We need to help them by paying them fair wages, and we need to ensure that the HRA warrant article number 32 is passed this town meeting. And we must lobby our state legislature to allow us to provide our valued employees the good health coverage that they deserve and that we and they can afford. As, as you know, there will be an override vote on Tuesday, June 7th. Like many town leaders, I urge town meeting and citizens to get involved in the discussion about the future of our town. We have really benefited from the stability of the last multi-year plan, which allowed us to keep the promises made to the voters in the last override. And I believe again that there will be great benefit from this new plan. It is a shorter time period of three years in a time of great uncertainty. There is a vote about whether we continue to be great, to be a great welcoming community or one that continues to lay off teachers, reduce mi minimum manning of firefighters and police, and decipate, decimate the DPW even further. Please come to the override kickoff next Sunday afternoon from, three, from 1 to 3 at the Masonic Temple on Academy Street. We would love to have you there. We started organizing about three weeks ago, and I was really pleased to see so many young families and an equal number of white-haired veterans become involved in this effort. The first organizational meeting drew 52 people, and the override hadn't even been voted on yet. Um, we meet every Saturday at 8 o'clock in the morning, and that's really early for the white-haired veterans, I'll tell you. Um, the, um, I want to, first of all, I would like to get all the officials and town meeting members who are all already working on the override to please stand up. Please ask them questions and talk to them about why it's so important you vote and work with us on this override. 
There are some really important Warren articles between, before town meeting this year, and we need your thoughtful consideration of possible changes about how we do business. The management of our town does a darn good job, and I am really proud of the people who sit behind me and to, my, to the side, to my right side over there. They are an energetic, engaged group of managers who enjoy each other and take great pride in their work. I give a lot of credit to our town manager, Brian Sullivan, for his finding these stellar employees, and I want to thank him. They and all the town workers in the town, they and all the workers in the town deserve our respect and appreciation. As an example, how in the world did Jimmy Dodge's crew of 19 people, yes, 19, manage to plow five square mo miles of roadway so efficiently all winter long? It was a miracle. You think the snow started on the 26th of June, I mean of December, and it <laughs> felt like June. <laughs> And I'm not surprised if it wouldn't snow again tomorrow. Anyway, they, were, they did a wonderful job, and we're really proud of the work that they did. <laughs> we're going to be making a lot of big decisions this spring. Should we sell or lease the town assets of the Crosby and Parmenter schools in order to help rebuild the Thompson School? We will be thinking about continuing our trends toward consolidating functions by voting on the combi combined town school human resources department. And under Article 51, we will be discussing whether to rework the way that our town and schools handle their financial affairs. We will be discussing whether it is time for Arlington to take a big step forward by adopting pay as you throw. All these p decisions have the potential to change the way we do business. In closing, I would like to urge you to think of the words of my former neighbor, the wise, very wise Charlie Foskett, who in a re recent memo talked about what he believes is Arlington's core mission. He and I don't agree much, but we do on this, and I want to read what he said. Number one in our core mission, ensure public safety, public health, and public order. This includes police, fire, health department, building codes, zoning, traffic rules. Without these, our citizens could not go about their daily activities. Number two, maintaining public works and infrastructure, the highways, the byways, the buildings, and the equipment necessary to assure the first mission. If fire trucks can't get to a residence or a commercial building, there is no, if there is no center for administration, none of the core objectives can be achieved. Thirdly, and very importantly, the education of our children. Since the earliest days of our colonies, our commonwealth, our nation, and our town, this has been the primary obligation of our common society. And lastly, other common and societal objectives. These include social backup nets for our senior citizens and the less fortunate parks and recreation, arts and culture, beautification programs, and many other things that we'll hear about when we have reports um, to this town meeting tonight. I've always had great confidence in this town meeting. You balance out the political agendas with your thoughtfulness and diligence. We need your thoughtfulness this spring, and I look forward to lively debates. Thank you for your time, your involvement, and your commitment to our community. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Rowe. It is requested that the members of the Board of Selectmen and elected officials of the town, town manager, department heads of the, of the town and staff, superintendent of schools and staff, committees, commissions, and boards of the town, Minuteman Regional Vocational Technical School District Committee, and superintendent, members of the general court representing Arlington, also any consultants who have been retained to work for the town relative to articles to be acted upon by this meeting and representatives of the news media be permitted to sit within the town meeting enclosure. All in favor say yes. Yes. Opposed? Unanimous vote. I'd like to introduce for this first time our new town clerk, Ms. Lucarelli, who now has a job.
Do you, do you read the call of them? Do you say something? It is moved that if all the t business of the meeting is yes. set forth in the warrant for the annual town meeting is not disposed of at the session, when the meeting adjourns, it adjourns to Wednesday, April 27, 2011, at 8 o'clock. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Okay, so we don't finish tonight. We're going to come back next Wednesday. <laughs> yes, sir? Not yet. Okay. No, I was wondering why you're raising your hand. I haven't called for any announcements or resolutions. No, no, we have to wait. I'll call. I'll give you a chance. When it comes. Thank you. Now, are there any announcements and resolutions? <laughs> now you can. You've got, you've got to do it in order. Do you have an announcement or a resolution? Come to the microphone, please. You have to wait till things happen. When you do, when you presenting articles, I think you should count who is voting yes and count who is voting yes, and never say that anything is a unanimous. Excuse me, I sometimes have trouble <laughs> with my tongue. You should never say that anything is a unanimous vote because there are so many people who do not believe in a yes vote when you're essentially saying that everybody believes in a yes vote with a unanimous vote. And I, I think that's an immoral way to continue this process. You should count who exactly believes in a yes vote and who exactly believes in a, a no vote. I had noticed in the past that some, a few people sometimes were against cert, certain articles and it was, they had to Mr. take, Marquis? they needed Mr. a lot of guts to, to say, to stand up in a situation like this. Mr. Marquis, I'll take that under advisement and I'll follow the rules as set out in the bylaws. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Any other announcements or resolutions, sir? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Eric Helmuth, Precinct 12. The Yes for Arlington campaign, which supports the Proposition 2.5 override vote on June 7th, invites all town residents to the campaign kickoff this Sunday, May 1st, from 1 to 3 at the Masonic Temple on Academy Street. Child care and light snacks will be provided. Learn more about why we need an override, find out what services will be affected, and volunteer to help on the campaign. You can learn more at the campaign's website, which is www.yesforarlington.org or on Facebook at facebook.com slash yes for Arlington. Thank you. Any other announcements or resolutions? Oh, Mr. Sullivan. Uh, Brian Sullivan, uh, town manager. You do have a resolution under Article 31 that's at your places. It deals with uh, health care legislation. Uh, as everyone is aware, this is an issue that the town has been dealing with for the last couple of years with, some, with its employees' uh, unions. Um, just recently, the House came out with proposed legislation that will finally give Season Town some relief in this area and provide us with some authority to take control over our health care costs. Uh, the, the, uh, this legislation will be debated uh, sometime this week, uh, hopefully uh, later in the week. Uh, we're proposing that this resolution be adopted by town meeting under Article 31, and we'll be bringing this up uh, Wednesday night and, uh, and asking that Article 31 be taken out of order, that we may uh, present this to you to explain it and hopefully have the town meeting uh, vote to support this. Thank you. All right, any other? Just um, to follow up on that, the Board of Selectmen voted 4 to 1 in favor of the resolution with Mrs. Mahan. Um, Voting in the negative. 
Thank you. Any other announcements or resolutions? Sir. Either come forward or get the microphone from Ms. Weber. Yeah. <laughs> Joe Marshall, Precinct 4. I have an Arlington resident who would like to address the body regarding the override. Uh, On know, an announcement. Unless he's announcing a meeting or something. He is. All right. It's, we don't want to have an override debate here, though. It's after not a debate, one, just, just a simple announcement of committees. Okay, after um, this one, though, I don't want to have any more about the override. My name is Sean Harrington. I'm the secretary to the Arlington Coalition for Responsible Spending, and I'm here to inform you that next Thursday at the Jefferson Cutter House, we will be having our first meeting to an anti-override campaign for anyone that is interested. All are welcome to attend. If you wish to contact me, I'll be here at the meeting for the rest of the meeting, or you can contact me through... Um, Joe Marshall or some of the other town meeting members. Again, the Arlington Coalition for Responsible Spending will be starting its anti-override campaign next Thursday at the Jefferson Cutter House. Thank you. Thank you. Any other announcements? Resolutions? Hearing none. Uh, seeing none, hearing none. Okay, Article 3 is not before us. Any reports of committees? Ms. Ms. Rowe. Mr. Moderator, I move that the Board of Selectmen's report be received and um, the supplement also received. Thank you. Yes, thank you. <laughs> Board of Selectmen reports are so received. Mr. Tosti. I move that the reports of the uh, Finance Committee be received. The reports are so received. Foskett. <clears throat> Mr. Moderator, I move that the report of the uh, Capital Planning Committee be received. And I'd like to make a, a brief announcement. Sure. <clears throat> um, I am going to be absent from the meeting on the, uh, Monday, uh, May 9th, and Wednesday, May 11th. So at the opening of the special town meeting, uh, Mr. Tosti is going to move that articles uh, four and five of the special town meeting and that the uh, capital budget article 57 be taken up on, uh, on May 16th. And I just wanted to uh, make that announcement in advance so the members would have some notice. Thank you. Okay. Thank you. Report so received. Bruce? Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. On behalf of the Arlington Redevelopment Board, I would ask that the uh, annual Bruce report Simmons. and the recommended votes of the Arlington Redevelopment Board be received. Reports are so received. And I'm just going to remind everybody, when you come to the microphone every single time, name and precinct for the record. Even though Gabe knows us all, we still have to get it for the, for the tape. Thank you. Any other reports? No other reports at this time. Ms. Rowe? Yes, Mr. Moderator, it's Clarissa Rowe, Precinct 6. Um, I would like to introduce my colleagues on the Board of Selectmen. On the far right, Kevin Greeley. To his left, Diane Mahan. To her left, Annie LaCourt. And to her, her left, our newest member, Dan Dunn. Um, now, it's usually the tradition of the uh, chair of the Board of Selectmen to introduce the department heads. I think that they can introduce themselves, starting with Mr. Marlinga over there. Would you just get up and, and give your name and, and for the new town meeting members what you do for the town, please? Why don't we get the traveling microphone so they can pass it around? Great idea. Instead of everyone running back and forth. Thank you, Mrs. Weber. 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 Weber? Okay. Ed Maralenga, legal department, workers' compensation agent, and benefits attorney. Christine Connolly, Director of Health and Human Services. 
Mary Ellen Loud, Library Director. I'm David Good, and I'm the Chief Technology Officer. Michael Byrne, Director of Inspectional Services. Frederick Ryan, Chief of Police. Karen Malloy, Personnel Director. Bob Jefferson, Fire Chief. Mike Rademacher, Director of Public Works. Adam Chapdelaine, Deputy Town Manager. Brian Sullivan, Town Manager. Marie Kripalka, Board Administrator to the Board of Selectmen. Juliana Rice, Town Council. Al Tosti, Chair of the FinCom. Dick Cranning, Vice Chair, FinCom. Charlie Foskett, Vice Chair, FinCom. Helen Jones, Vice Chair, FinCom. Gloria Turkall, Executive Secretary, Finance Committee. Carol Kowalski, Director of Planning and Community Development. Chris Sapinski, Redevelopment Authority. Andy West, Arlington Redevelopment Board. Mike Kerr, Arlington Redevelopment Board. Bruce Fitzsimmons, Vice Chair of VARB. Okay, can we have a hand for all these wonderful people? Uh, the Finance Committee reports are in the back. Hopefully everybody has one. Uh, I just like to, when we get closer into the uh, <coughs> excuse me, financial articles, I'll give the report of the uh, Finance Committee and introduce my members of the uh, committee. I would like to point out a couple of things that might be important for the discussion on Wednesday on the uh, resolution uh, that the selectmen have put before you. The Finance Committee uh, tonight voted unanimously to support that resolution. Uh, it means a great deal for the town. On the last page of the Finance Committee report are all the, at least on the town side, all of the losses that you'll see in services and employment uh, that we're going to be dealing with today and how important uh, the Speaker and the House Ways and Means Committee uh, proposed reforms are uh, to this town. Uh, with that, I move that the recommended votes contained in the respective reports of the Finance Committee, the Board of Selectmen, the Redevelopment Board, and other committees be before the uh, meeting without further motion. Okay. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? So moved. Move that Article 3 be laid upon the table. All in favor? Aye. Opposed? Article 3 is upon the table. That brings us to Article 4. Uh, appointment of the measure of Wooden Park. This is our last colonial era appointment that the town meeting gets to make. So the person who goes out and measures your cord of wood and or your cord of bark if you think you're being shorted. Ms. Rowe? Yes, thank you. Like thank you, Mr. Moderator. Um, we would like to have a vote that the measure of wooden bark and um, other usual town officers be appointed by the town meeting. Um, Mr. Fitzmorris, a long-term um, town meeting member, is our commissioner of wooden bark, uh, measure of wooden bark. Do I have a second on that motion? Do I have any other appointments? Hearing all the appointments, all in favor of appointing John Fitzmorris, measure of wooden bark, please say yes. Yes. Opposed? Mr. Fitzmorris, you are so appointed. That brings us to Article 5, the election of the assistant town moderator. This is where we get to a, make a recommendation as who we would like to take my place if I'm not able to do it. Do I have any uh, recommendations for appointments? Jim, you want to do it? <laughs> Christine Deschler, Precinct 19. I nominate Jim Connor. Okay. Any other nominations? Hearing no other nominations, all in favor of Jim O'Connor being appointed assistant town moderator, please say yes. 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 All opposed, say no. Mr. O'Connor, you are now the assistant town, mod <coughs> assistant town moderator. Congratulations. Article 6. We have before us to recommend a vote of the ARB for no action on the zoning map amendment. Did I get that right? Yep. 
So all in favor of no action, please say yes. 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 All opposed? So no action on number six. That brings us to number seven, zoning bylaw amendment. I'll allow cemetery use in open space districts. Mr. West. I'm Andy West with the Arlington Redevelopment Board introducing Article 7 to see if the town will vote to amend the zoning bylaw to allow cemetery use solely for cremated remains uh, on land under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. Um, uh, the town cemeteries, we understand, are reaching their capacity. This is an ongoing issue. It's getting more critical. Our cemeteries are already providing um, uh, what's called cremains, cre cremated remains, and that demand is expanding. This zoning change would lead to some, lim some limited but much needed expansion for cremated remains only. The ARB was concerned in, in uh, crafting this that the installations never became cemetery-like, never like uh, a, a, real cem a regular cemetery. No gravestones, burial plots, mausoleums, no building structures. Um, crematory markers might be built into low walls or flat stone paving that would blend into the landscape. You can see this in the article, uh, the verbiage in the article. Um, so these markers would be integrated into the landscape design. Um, a proposal would first have to be approved by the Conservation Commission and then by the ARB. So this goes to special permit. Uh, permit process, and we would make sure that in that process, the special permit would make sure that it is appropriate and does not detract from the primary purpose, which is the open space. This zoning change addresses the shortage of burial space without detracting in any way to the quality of the town's open space. It's a good idea. The ARB has voted uh, unanimously for Article 7. Mr. Schlickman. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. I rise in opposition to this article. Cemeteries, my friends, are forever. If we make a mistake on any other zoning bylaw, maybe in 50 years, our mistake will be undone. If we zone land for, say, a gas station where a gas station really doesn't belong, and it's built, and we rezone it, it becomes a non-conforming use, and eventually market forces will change that gas station into something else. Cemeteries are forever. This is not a zoning change to be taken lightly. You are, in essence, giving up in perpetuity your rights and responsibilities as a town meeting to decide where the town cemetery is. Because under this bylaw, you are going to take appointed boards, appointed by an appointed town manager, with no accountability, and with the potential of making substantive changes to Arlington open space, decisions that should be made by this meeting and not unelected boards. Under the terms of this bylaw, it only affects land under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. Well, we could come back here next year and find 10.2 acres of Mount Gilboa Cemetery. We could find 12 acres of Turkey Hill Cemetery. We could find three acres of the cemetery at Window on the Mystic Lakes. We could find a one-acre cemetery at the end of Forest Street on the Winchester Line. And we could find a cemetery in the neighborhood park, in my neighborhood, in my precinct, on my block, which is now known as Cook's Hollow Park. I do not want to give up our right as a town meeting and our responsibility to our neighbors to make these decisions in this venue. Please vote down this article which takes away 
your ability to make a very vital decision about what's done. Because once there's a cemetery in what was once open space, what was once conservation land, ladies and gentlemen, that's forever and there's no going back. Please vote this down. Thank you. Mr. Roy, you're next. Thank you. Clarissa Royal Precinct um, 6. This, is, um, this warrant article is the result of many years of work. It started as the um, conclusion of a two-year study on cemetery expansion needs in Arlington. We have less than six years of cemetery space left. What we did for two years was look at the existing open spaces and decided that the one place that we could combine the uses was in Cook's Hollow. The next couple of years that we worked on this was it was a joint effort of the Board of Selectmen, the Historic Commission, because it's adjacent to an historic neighborhood, the Conservation Commission, and the Cemetery Commission, all of whom came together to present a design to the neighborhood. We had two public meetings. There was some opposition but overall, the positive, there were positive comments. This is one step. It's a technical step. I don't really think that um, Mr. Schlickman is as informed about the process as he should be. This was a joint effort of the Historic Commission, the Conservation Commission, and the Cemetery Commission. So I urge you to vote in favor of this article. Thank you. Thank you. Ms. Fiori? Elsie Fiore, Precinct 2, and thank you, Mr. Schlickman. You knew exactly what you were talking about. I rise particularly because Cook's Hollow is being targeted. I'm reading from a book, since I have every paper from day one when I started here. It's the 1974 town report. The uh, Conservation Commission had a year of varied activities emphasizing concern for preservation of Arlington's limited natural resources. The Millbrook Hydrological and Floodplain Study, jointly sponsored by the Redevelopment Board and the Conservation Commission, and prepared, prepared by the firm of C. McGuire, was completed in 1974. During the year, a great deal of time and effort was spent, this is 1974, on the Cook's Hollow project, phase two landscaping was completed in the spring of 1974. Cook's Hollow was dedicated at a public ceremony held on October 19th, 1974, and a plaque was installed commemorating the dedication of Cook's Hollow Park. There's more, but the thing is the Garden Club was extremely active in getting this Cook's Hollow Park in place. I found a list the other day, but unfortunately it disappeared uh, before my eyes, listing all of the people who gave money to buy trees and plants and all different kinds of things to make Cook's Hollow a place where residents, if they were walking down Mystic Street, could sit down and rest. They could enjoy uh, the few alewives that might be going through. And uh, it was really a very nice uh, place. Over the years, unfortunately, it hasn't been kept as well as it should have. The preparation for it was enormous. The, the town wanted to put a community safety, public uh, building and housing, and we had to shift some conservation land that we had. We owned two little pieces. We shifted them with other businesses so that our land got closer. I uh, informed uh, Carol Kowalski, the chairman of uh, the, uh, well, the, the planner, I'm sorry, that even in the, today in the community safety building parking, area. There were really five spaces where the land belongs to the Conservation Commission and it's supposed to be for people who can want to park and come and visit the park. But it's taken up with fire trucks and other cars that park in there because somebody put a wall across so nobody knows that it's connected to us. There's a lot of work that needs to be done and, and certainly blankly stating that we should be able to put cemetery uses in Anything that belongs to the Conservation Commission that's considered open space 
I, I will say, as my, uh, Peter Braun, who was on the Conservation Commission, as I was when Cook's Hollow was put in place, and uh, Dora Rheingold, who's deceased, Eric Verrill, and uh, one other person. Uh, he thinks it's a gross, I spoke to Peter Braun just before I came, and he considers a gross misuse of conservation land to use it for these uh, crema, cremated remains. And who's going to go and sit down and say, isn't this a wonderful view? Let's keep it a very nice park. Let's restore and keep the brook the way it is and have it what it was intended to be in 1974. Thank you very much. Thank you, Ms. Fiore. Uh, Mr. Loretti? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Chris Loretti, Precinct 7. Um, I appreciate Mr. Schlickman's and Ms. Fiore's comments, but I, I think they're really overstating the case. And I think it's important to keep in perspective where cemeteries, all types of cemeteries, can be put right now. In fact, cemeteries are allowed in the R0 and R1 district. That, those, these are zoning districts for single-family homes. And they're also the districts, the R1 district is commonly used for town-owned property. Mr. Schlickman seems afraid that uh, appointed boards may allow cemeteries for cremated remains in the open space district. Um, I'd like to inform him that under the existing bylaw, uh, uh, these same boards could allow a cemetery in this town garden right next door here because that's in the R1 zoning district. So the controls that are in place here are really no different. The, I'm sorry, the controls that are being proposed under this bylaw change are no different than the controls that are currently in place for putting cemeteries in town-owned property uh, as, as it currently exists. And in fact, they're stricter because it's only land um, under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission in the open space district. So there's that control. Um, it's not any land in the open space, space district, even though most of, that is, most of it is under the jurisdiction of the Conservation Commission. And it's only on town-owned land. Um, currently, you could have cemeteries going into privately owned land with a special permit. Uh, and so the purpose behind this um, articles, as, as was explained, was to simply broaden the areas where these types of cemetery use, and again, again, it's only for cremated remains, might take place. I would also remind town meeting members that about a dozen years ago, there was no open space district. Most of those open space parcels were in the R1 zoning district. You could have put these types of crematoriums in there by special permit 12 years ago. You could have put a regular cemetery in there with mausoleums 12 years ago. This is actually a much stricter, a much more carefully crafted um, bylaw than what is currently in place for cemeteries. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Loretti. Mr. Ma. Uh, John Maher, uh, Precinct 14. I rise in strong support of the recommended vote of the Redevelopment Board. This process has, has, uh, has been indicated, has been in the process for a long time. The, the uh, major boards have been involved, Conservation Commission, uh, open, uh, I believe uh, Park Commission, and Cemetery Commission, and they've all come to a conclusion that this is an appropriate way uh, to make a small uh, area available for cremains. This is a restful area. Uh, this is uh, we're, we're dealing with a, a real crisis with regard to our cemetery open space. It has been indicated by Mrs. Rowe that this, uh, uh, our cemeteries are going to run out of space in six or seven years. I just don't see what the big deal is. Uh, it seems to me it's a perfectly appropriate place to, uh, to have cremains. Remember, and, and, and a previous speaker spoke about, well, we're giving up authority to appoint officials. I mean, that's who runs the town. I mean, he was the, these are the people who we trust to make informed decisions, uh, subject to some control by town meeting. It's been indicated by town, that a uh, previous speaker, the town meeting is giving up this authority. In fact, the authority is before you now to permit this use. So I believe that, uh, in my view, this is an appropriate way uh, to uh, begin to address in a tasteful manner uh, our cemetery, uh, lack of cemetery space. And it's not as if it's going to be a helter-skelter uh, grouping of, uh, 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 and a taking over of that area. It is subject to a special permit, uh, and the appropriate permit authority 
having been informed by the other boards about what their desires are, I'm sure are going to do this in a tasteful manner. Again, I urge strong support of the recommended vote of the Redevelopment Board. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Weddle. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Bruce Weltel, Precinct uh, 12. Uh, I need to reintroduce myself to some of you. I was a town meeting member here uh, for many years. I was a uh, member of and chairman of the Conservation Commission uh, at the time the uh, top portion of Mount Gilboa was acquired. Uh, I greatly respect Mr. Schlickman and, um, and Mrs. Fury, but with that respect, I think they are wrong. Uh, we have trusted a great deal, as Mr. Marr points out, uh, to uh, unelected appointed boards. This town wouldn't run without them. I can think of some other examples of uh, non-elected boards uh, making decisions with which I strongly disagree, but I don't think this is one of them. Uh, I, I think the, uh, the Redevelopment Board has considered the matter carefully, as Mrs. Rowe has pointed out, and uh, I have had occasion as a non, no longer member of the Conservation Commission to attend their meetings over a prolonged period of time on another matter within the past year. And in my opinion, this town is exceptionally fortunate to have a Conservation Commission of the professionalism and caliber of that group. So I, I hope you will support the recommendation. Thank you, Mr. Weddle. Mr. Judd? Lyman Judd, Precinct 9. Uh, welcome back, Bruce. <laughs> Long time no see. Uh, I disagree with uh, the last two speakers. I agree with Mr. Schlickman and Mrs. Fiore for a simple reason. <clears throat> I don't have, have no idea whether the Cemetery Commission has ex uh, explored the possibility of expanding across into a garden place, a garden street, whatever it is called now, going across the brook behind the uh, very large brick building. This would bring it uh, into the area behind Armstrong Ambulance. But further over, there are businesses there, but uh, I would have to say what I've seen of them. Uh, they're not brand new, shiny, bright buildings, and I have no idea what they do, do or don't pay for any kind of uh, taxes, but I would look at it as at least explore that first and see if that can be done. Secondly, as far as uh, cremated remains, the military cemetery, that is the National Cemetery at Cape Cod, has covered that long ago. They build what they call a columbarium, which is a wall with a series of compartments on it. Something like mailboxes, but much larger. And the, the uh, cremated remains go in there. The door is engraved with the person's name and whatever. And apparently it seems to be quite satisfactory for burying any of our veterans. So if it's good enough for the veterans, I think it's good enough for me. I think, as I say, we should see if we can expand anywhere around the present cemetery. How much would it cost? In fact, as I can remember, there was a property on uh, uh, Mystic Street right next to the brick building I referred to. And uh, for a while it was lying fallow and it was in bad condition. That's when the town should have gone after it, but some people don't think ahead. That would have given us that much more space. However, as I say, I do think because of the importance of this, this is an open-ended zoning bylaw. That means any open space. I would rather have the town meeting have approval or disapproval of any specific space so that we'll know what is being planned, where it's going to go, and if, what the neighbors would think. So I think we should put this to rest for the time being and hope that the uh, Cemetery Commission and the other boards can at least follow some of my suggestions and maybe make it a little more clear that the uh, town meeting, which is the legislative body of this town, should have at least a little more input, I think, than just saying, okay, do whatever. That means we'll have to chase the politicians around or the appointed people to try to find out why they did this or that. 
So I say a no vote on this is probably appropriate. Thank you very much. Ms. Rowe, I think Ms. Rowe had an answer to one of your yeah. questions about if I did. Point of, something else. Point of information. Um, Mr. Judd, um, one of the things that the Cemetery Expansion Commission looked at every piece of real estate in Arlington, including, obviously, the parcels of land that were immediately adjacent to the cemetery. In fact, um, there were some overtures made to the different property owners before some of the improvements in that area were made, like where our Armstrong ambulance is, and the cost was prohibitive. We couldn't come to any kind of agreement on a cost that they would be willing to um, pay for those spaces. Another point of information is that cremains is the technical term for what we're talking about, but it is it does include columbarium spaces. Um, it's but it's the technical term, so that that's for um, your information. Thank you, um, Mr. Tosti. Al Tosti, Precinct 3. By the way, the Finance Committee has nothing to do with this. If I'm speaking for the Finance Committee, I'm at the Central. If I'm speaking for me, I'm here. I just have two questions uh, in reading through all the materials. Uh, whoever could answer this, maybe from the Redevelopment Board. Are we talking about something where the ashes are directly interred into the soil and there might be a plaque at the beginning or the entrance that would say, you know, who is buried there and dates? Or are we talking about uh, vessels being put into the ground with plaques on the ground so it really is the extension of a cemetery into conservation. So I'm just trying to get a sense of what this is going to be. Thank you. Ms. Kowalski. Please. I'm Carol Kowalski. I'm the Director of Planning and Community Development. Uh, thank you, town meeting members. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. We have some slides, if um, you'd bear with us while uh, Mr. Good, if I could ask Mr. Good to bring up the, um, there's a PowerPoint presentation with just four slides that I'd like to show you. Let me know if you need help finding that set of slides. Okay, if, if you could please go to slide 24. This is a conceptual plan. While the slides are coming up, I think it's important to uh, review that the genesis of this was a joint plan between the Conservation Commission and the Cemetery Commission. It's mutually beneficial because you've heard that there is a crisis with trying to find cemetery space. There's also quite a problem in trying to restore conservation land and to maintain the conservation land. This would, this plan that you're seeing here is a design that was created as a product of this joint effort, which would include restoring the conservation values at Cook's Hollow in the course of implementing the cremains locations in low stone walls. This is a, a site plan. The next slide is t slide 26, which shows the Mystic Street entryway. And I'm showing you these to give you an idea of the flavor of what it would look like afterwards. Slide, uh, just two more slides. Slide 34 is a photo of how the proposed walls would appear with the cremains in, inside this very naturalistic stone walls. These would be proposed throughout the site plan. And this next um, slide, 35, helps to answer that question too. It's a drawing of some of the proposed, a conceptual drawing of the low stone walls where the cremains would be. So I think it helps to see this. This, is a, um, this plan was produced and approved by both commissions but it couldn't possibly be implemented without adopting this uh, amendment to the zoning bylaw. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Kowalski. Just another point of information. This was a joint effort of three commissions, the Conservation Commission, the Cemetery Commission, and the Historic Commission. The next person on the list is Roland Chappell.
Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Roll in Chapter Precinct 12, ex AR Beer. And also an ex Conservation Commission member. I was there back in 74 when we did all that work. In fact, the advocate took a picture of me in the middle of the stream with a clam digger cleaning it out. My wife thinks I'm crazy. One of the reasons I think this is a great idea and therefore I stand to support the recommendation of the ARB's uh, article is I want to be buried here. Now I can go to the Cape. If you're a veteran, you can go to the Cape. And you can fit a little box down there if you'd like. I'd rather fit it in here. I think it would be great to be there and listen to the water rushing by. It's not that big a deal here. We're not talking about huge walls. And so, you want to have a look at a nice column here and go to Mount Auburn Cemetery. They're very nice. I urge you to support this. Thank you. Mr. McCabe. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Harry McCabe, Preaching 21. Unfortunately, I have to disagree with my uh, long-term uh, fellow town meeting member, Elsie Fiore. Um, Elsie and I came into the meeting together 50 years ago, and we've been here ever since, but we're not going to be here forever. I believe that tonight we're celebrating our 50th anniversary in the town meeting. The, the problem before us really uh, is not whether this particular location or that particular location should be a cemetery. The problem is we need cemetery space. We're desperate, that is as a town, we're desperate uh, for cemetery space. I would ask uh, the opponents of this proposal, uh, where would they bury our dead? And I believe that uh, we do have an obligation to provide uh, cemetery space. I'm a member of the Council on Aging and have been for uh, many years and have some uh, knowledge of uh, the uh, senior citizen population in the town. Uh, currently, uh, there's approximately uh, 10,000 uh, senior citizens in the town of Arlington and we haven't seen the new census yet but uh, the the estimates that we're hearing is that there may be as many as 12,000 senior citizens in the town and we've been told that uh, by 2015 25 percent of the residents of the town of Arlington uh, will be senior citizens. And like it or not, uh, death and taxes are always going to be with us. And fortunately, we have this good body here to deal with uh, both of those questions. Uh, so I, I recommend strongly, uh, as a person who's been involved for many years, uh, to uh, support this article. Uh, I think the fear mongers uh, wrong. Uh, my uh, experience is that uh, if the, the town uh, wishes to uh, provide cemetery space somewhere else, that they would have to come back here uh, because there's always money involved. And uh, we not only uh, control where the cemeteries will be, we control uh, the money and it's called the golden rule and that is he who got the gold rules that's us thank you mr mccabe the gentleman in the center back behind mr judd yes sir okay i'll keep 
Um, Mr. Smith. Smith, Precinct 17. I've got a very emotional feeling about cemeteries in general. For a period of almost three years, I worked in Bosnia, mostly in Sarajevo, shortly after the Balkan Wars in which many hundreds of thousands of people were killed. In many cities in Bosnia, and especially in Sarajevo, cemeteries were just built all over the place, in town parks and everything, mainly because there was a strong emotional feeling when a certain group of people were killed. But it, it made it sort of a blight on the whole town and really the whole country to see these, all these scattered cemeteries. You go up in a hillside and everywhere you look there's a cemetery. In Arlington, I don't see that happening. We don't have this much space available. But here we've got three bodies that have looked into this, and they seem to have done all that can be done. I, do, I doubt if town meeting would be in a position to do anything better. As Paul Schlickman says, they would have to approve it, but I, I think before they approve it, they would, again would be relying on these same bodies. So I think we better do something now before we run out of space, and because of this, I think the present plan is what we need. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Hanner. Bill Hanner, Precinct 2. I have a couple of questions through the chair, please. Uh, number one, how many uh, places are there planned for in this particular place? Ms. Kowalski, do you have the answer? Even if it's a good estimate. I don't. And I, I have to say, um, I'm Carol Kowalski, Director of Planning and Community Development. Um, I don't have that number at my fingertips. It is available on the uh, design on the website, and I think it may even be in the slide presentation. However, it, I need to be clear uh, to make a distinction between the bylaw amendment that's before town meeting is separate from the plan that's been put forth by the three commissions. It is true that you can't implement that plan without the zoning bylaw change, but the zoning bylaw change would not have the effect of making this automatic. The plan whose slides you've seen would still require an application for a hearing for a special permit from the redevelopment board if this bylaw is, is approved. Okay, my follow-up question with this, even without this information, is assuming that this is similar to a cemetery, and I'm 65 and not making any direct plans right now, but future plans of possibly purchasing something like this, is it quite possible that this could be sold out before it's even produced, thus bringing us back to the exact same problem we have at the beginning, needing more space? Uh, I am at the age where you do future planning. No, I can. In Arlington, you have to be deceased before you can apply for a plant plot. If the cemetery commissions are Ms. Rokits. Okay, then I won't be planning on Arlington in the near future. Then, the <laughs> since I'm a veteran, I'll, I, I'll look forward to the Cape. Then the, the short answer is uh, yes, of course, it will absolutely uh, any 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 additional cemetery land or cemetery uh, area would run out of space. Thank you. Mr. Berkowitz. Thanks, Mr. Moderator. Bill Berkowitz, Precinct 8. Uh, question, just to clarify what we're voting on, the slides that we saw and some of the discussion revolved around the Cook's Hollow plan, but uh, am I correct that what we're voting on is, is uh, to allow cremains in all open spaces, not just Cook's Hollow? We are voting on the recommended vote as in the ARB report under Article 7, which is to amend the zoning uh -huh. bylaw. Article 5, Section 5.04, table use, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera, not the plan. 
plan of pretty pictures. <coughs> they show us if we vote on this, they may come back and ask for a special permit sure. to do this. <clears throat> Thank you. I'm curious as to why we, uh, given this presentation, why we were not asked to vote simply on the Cook's Hollow plan. And in that connection, I think it's unfortunate that we don't have a figure uh, on the number of cremains that uh, the Cook's Hollow plan uh, could hold. So I do have some skepticism about approving a broad plan when uh, uh, when we might approve uh, cremains at Cooks Hollow if we knew the details of how many cremains it would hold. Thank you. Um, point, point of information, Clarissa Rowe, Precinct 6. Unfortunately, I think I'm the only one that's sat on this um, project that's in town meeting. I, I believe, and my memory is getting older as I reach um, an older age, I believe there's 76 units. This, the Cooks Hollow work was a feasibility study and the reason that we're here today is because we can't go into any kind of detailed design until this zoning bylaw is changed. There are many, many more pieces of this puzzle that need to be fixed and that's why the plan isn't being brought to you. We would continue to have the involvement of the Conservation Commission, the Cemetery Commission, the Historic Commission and the Redevelopment Authority as the plan goes forward. Anything else, Mr. Berkowitz? No, okay. Um, Mr. Baer? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Paul Baer, Precinct 13. I have a couple of questions. Uh, would people have to pay to have their cremains put here? Say that again, sir? Would people have to pay to have their cremains put here? I, yes, sir. Yes. And would that money be, I assume that would go into the perpetual care fund of the cemetery? Yes. And would that money be available for maintaining the whatever area might be used for this? Purpose. Yes, that was the purpose. It was one of the, the reasons that this was thought about is that we would have perpetual care in an open space that doesn't, didn't have a lot of maintenance as it was, except for the good graces of Roly Chapit and the um, Garden Committee, Garden Club. Thank you. Thank you. Um, second row right, is it guy? Did you have your hand up, sir? Yeah. Uh, uh, Bill Kaplan, Precinct 6. Um, it strikes me that Arlington doesn't have a lot of open space uh, and that people are going to continue dying and that we can cram cremains into little parks, but eventually we're still going to run out of space. And uh, there is open space, you know, in the state of Massachusetts. And it, it's, I'm not quite clear on why everyone who dies in Arlington has to stay in Arlington. Uh, and, and, and whether whether we might not be better served in, in seeking other areas to, uh, to inter remains. Um, I, I mean, at some point we could fill every nook and cranny with cremains, but we're still going to run out of space. Did you want an answer to that question? Do you want an answer to that question? Okay, she'll, she can give you one. Yeah, I can give you one. <laughs> um, we actually did live, look in other communities for additional cemetery space. I believe there is a cemetery that's not full in Bedford. Is that where it was, Brian? Yeah. yeah, and we contacted them to see if they were willing to accept um, graves from Arlington. We also um, looked very closely at Busa Farm which, as you know, does not belong to us. Um, but we, we did um, think about other open spaces and other com surrounding communities to see if there was any way that we could um, buy something like Busa Farm that could be used for cemetery use. Obviously, that was not in the cards for us. Ms. Phelps? OK, we have a motion to terminate debate on the question. Second? Okay. All in favor of terminating debate, please say yes. Yes. All opposed, say no. No. My opinion, it's a two-thirds vote. Debate is terminated. 
Um, <clears throat> we have now before us a recommended vote of the Island Community Development Board on Article 7. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. All opposed, say no. No. Okay, it's a uh, zoning bylaw, so it has to be a two-third vote. I couldn't tell because that wasn't unanimous. So everybody in favor, please rise. Um, Ms. Mahan, will you be our counter up front? Mr. Schlickman, will you count for us? Mr. O'Connor. Um, yes, Mr. McCabe. We already terminated debate. Yeah, it's terminated. Now we're voting on the article. Yes, we are, Harry. Ma'am, in, in a purple shirt, can you count for us? You don't want to do it. All right, Ms. Trembley. Um, no, I guess Harry's going to count. All right. Ms. Mahan? Twelve. Twelve up front. Mr. Schlickman? Twenty-eight to the left, my left. Mr. Trembley? 24. 24, my right center. Mr. O'Connor? 32. 32. Mr. McCabe? 26. All opposed, please rise. Ms. Mahan, zero. Mr. Schlickman? 18. 18. Mr. O'Connor? 15. 15. Mr. Trembley? 19. 19. Mr. McCabe? 15. 15. 15. 1 5. It's defeated. It's not a two-third vote. It's 122 in the positive, 67 in the negative. So it doesn't make two-thirds. We're not the English Parliament. <laughs> we have now before us Article 8. Um, it, wait a second. It's 9:30. What do you want, Mr. Judd? Ms. Rice? That's a point of information, actually. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Juliana Rice, Town Council. Uh, under state law, it's two years before it can be resubmitted unless the redevelopment board, as the town's planning board, gives a positive report. Okay. So it's like 924. So we're going to take our 10-minute break. The Arlington High School girls softball club is out here selling goodies for us. And we should all go out and help them out. Um, they'll be there Wednesday night as well. And also on Wednesday night, the, um, they'll be selling out in the front hall veterans Vietnam Veterans Memorial items, I think to support the wall that was just here. Is that right? Yes. Okay.
seven. Okay, thank you. Please come to order. All right, let's go. Come on and sit down. Mr. McKinney, sit down. Okay, we now have before us Article 8 of the Redevelopment of the, town of the Warrant Re Redevelopment Board Zoning Bylaw Amendment Wireless Communication Facilities. Mr. Fitzsimmons. Quiet, Mr. Fitzsimmons has the floor. Mr. Gentleman, Mr. Marquis, Mr. Fitzsimmons has the floor, sir. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bruce Fitzsimmons, member of the Arlington Redevelopment Board. Um, recommended vote of the ARB on Article 8 would change the zoning bylaw by transferring jurisdiction for applications pertaining to the installation of wireless communication facilities from the ARB to the Zoning Board of Appeals. Under the current version of Section 11.06 of the Zoning Bylaw, wireless communication facilities are specifically listed as a use allowed by special permit subject to environmental design review by the ARB. In practice, the ARB has found that many of the environmental design review criteria are simply not relevant to these types of applications. For example, there is very little, if any, reason to evaluate the effect of a wireless communication facility on traffic, public utilities, landscaping, open space, surface water drainage, advertising, microclimate, or sustainability. Accordingly, the review process is focused uh, rather narrowly on aesthetic concerns, such as matching the facility's paint color to blend in with that of the building on which the facilities are mounted, or concealing the equipment and architectural elements. Since the ARB has the ability to comment on special permit applications that are submitted to the ZBA, the ARB believes that it can still address concerns as to appearance by memorandum to the ZBA without requiring the applicant to go through the more demanding environmental design review process. Thank you. Thank you. Mr. Leonard? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17, with a question or two on this. Uh, the Redevelopment Board was kind enough to send us out the literature about the standards uh, that they were, let's say, holding the wireless people to. I wonder if we're giving this over to the Zoning Board of Appeals, is there anybody from the Zoning Board that could elaborate a little bit on maybe what one or two or three of the requirements that they would ask for the wireless people to meet? Um, I'm not sure there are any Zoning Board of Appeals members here. Are they? Ah, there you go. Can you answer his question? Well, wait, wait. We need the microphone. Name and precinct. Uh, Pam Heidel, um, uh, Precinct 18, and I'm here as a member of town meeting, not as a member of the ZBA. But we would look at um, some of the same criteria in terms of protection of public health, um, some of the same criteria that they say are not relevant, but we would look, we would look at those things as well. I mean, I have a list if you want to know. Thank you. No, I was just mentioning that it was awful nice for the Redevelopment Board to say what standards they were talking about, but I just wanted to make sure that because we were going to a different, let's say, committee or board, we weren't going away to the store here by lowering the standards that the wireless people would be meeting. And as again, I, I'd like to see something maybe later on down the line that would say the zoning board would request that the wireless people meet these particular standards before we would grant this special permit. My second question is, there is a lot of these uh, wireless equipment being installed over the past couple of months from different companies. Is there anybody or any organization or committee that does a checks and balance after these are installed? 
I guess my question is, once these are put up on certain locations, we tend to forget that they're there anymore. Is there anything that requires these people to come to us, as members of the town, boards of the town, and say, we're making additions, subtractions, adding voltage, making changes, anything at all, or do they just automatically do it because the thing has already been installed? I believe if they're changing something, they have to go to the building department for a permit. Is that true? Michael Byrne, Director of Inspectoral Services. That, that's true. If any, any changes to any of these facilities, they, they'd reopen that special permit docket at a public hearing and discuss it with whatever. But I guess if, if this goes through, it would be the zoning board. How often would a wireless company after an installation actually come back to the town in regards to, I mean, I'm not asking for like a daily report, yeah. but I'm asking in a sense that this is to notify you that we have done this, we are yeah. thinking of doing that, et cetera, et cetera. It, it happens quite often that you know, since uh, obviously technology has advanced such over the last several years that they do change the, the, the amounts in the actual receptors and things. Um, fairly often, and they, they would go back to the board and ask for permission for the aesthetics. So the, I think primarily aesthetics is what it's looking for. Right, so there is something that basically, if they just took it upon themselves to do something, they could, Good. for lack of a better word, be sanctioned or something by saying you should have conferred with the town first? Correct, yes, yeah. Okay, thank you. Thank you. Uh, Mr. McCabe. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Harry McCabe, Precinct 21. Uh, Mr. Moderator, I, I find the language uh, under the word vote uh, to be awkward, and I'm not convinced that that would stand the test of bond council. Uh, would, you, would you look at that real hard, uh, that the town votes? Should it say the town votes, or should it say that the town does hereby vote, or word to that effect? Uh, I'm not convinced that it would stand up. Thank you. Well, I don't think we have to go to bond council on the zoning bylaw amendment, but Ms. Rice, is the word vote acceptable as opposed to the word votes? Or do we need the word hereby votes? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Juliana Rice, Town Council. Um, I think that uh, the Mr. Moderator can make an administrative change to add an S to votes. Um, and that that would be sufficient to amend the bylaw. Okay, that change is hereby made. So I'll give you right S after the word vote. Thank you. Um, woman over here in the green. Yep. Janice Broadman, Precinct 15. I have a question, which is um, there is increasing concern on the part of a lot of bodies of the health hazards of wireless uh, antenna, communications, devices, etc. Does the ARB have the uh, purview to look at health co uh, consequences, potential health consequences? And if so, would the zoning board have the same ability to do that? Mr. Fitzsimmons, I kind of think that question is a little outside the scope, but I'll allow it most a quick answer. In short, the answer is no. Uh, this is a matter of federal law, and it's the FCC that would be looking at health hazards. Thank you. Uh, Mr. Mr. Chapman. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Roland Chapman, Precinct 12, and ex-ARB ARB member. Uh, I had the good fortune to work with the ARB from the very beginning when uh, cellular phone antenna towers were being proposed. My career was in the communications business. I worked for 25 years at Motorola, so I, had a, I knew enough to be dangerous, let's put it that way. Anyway, they uh, quite commonly depended upon me to review proposals by various uh, suppliers of, of primarily cell phone services. The towers are all over the place because they can increase the number of units that can be talking at the same time with more towers. Sometimes it's to fill in a dead spot. For example, up in Arlington Heights, if you're going through the heights, you may not be able to get your cell phone to work because the towers don't make it over the hill. 
So it was beneficial that we had an opportunity to inquire from all of the potential service companies, and there are half a dozen out there, uh, make sure that what they were doing was proper. And yes, it was not unusual to make sure that they painted the, the cell units the same colors as the bricks, for example, so it would be less obtrusive. And whenever possible, they put them up so that they didn't really show to the street as much as possible, unless you were across on a hill from them, then you could see them, of course. There are even some communities, for your information, who actually insisted that cell phone antennas had to look like pine trees. And unless you knew where to look, you probably wouldn't see them. So the situation has not changed in terms of whether the ARB or the Zoning Board of Review Board has to review those requirements. I think what they're trying to tell you is there were some things in the standard procedures that just don't make a lot of sense for, for them to review and it's time wasting. And so the hope would be that once the search permit request is going through the, the ZBA, that that will now be speeded up. They still would have the same requirements in terms of an expertise to provide a good answer to those. Whether they ask me or not is not important here. But somebody has to be able to tell them with some professional expertise what is being proposed and will it work? And is it not overkill? The answer to the question about a lot of the sites, whenever we proposed, uh, approved a project, it was not unusual for the, for the service company to put up a system that might have had three times or four times as much space as was necessary. The problem was once they put it up and the thing is constructed and they have to come back to the ARB and get the approval to add another five stations or something that goes inside that building on a rack, that part was already finished. And that was the reason, and they're doing the, they did this because over the last 10 years, everybody has a cell phone now, but that wasn't true back in the early 70s. And so they knew that there was going to be a demand for more of these uh, wireless communications capabilities, and so therefore they did build units. But they were smart, and so it was in the ARB. You find, if you look, you can find some of these station sites that are on a rooftop inside of a building that's all surrounded and it tries to match the decor of the building itself. That was the reason we do it. So this is a good idea. I hope you support it. Thank you, Mr. Chappell. Um, Mr. Judd. Mr. Fiore. Yeah. Lyman Judd, Precinct 9, permanent resident of Arlington. Born at Sims Hospital, and I'm probably going to reside at Mount Pleasant eventually, with maybe a one year uh, away at Harvard Medical School. However, on, on this particular subject, uh, and I stand to be corrected, it seems to me that 10 or 15 years ago, we had a problem with the Zoning Board of Appeals because I believe some of the time they had difficulty getting a quorum in order to act, and also that there seemed to be. Uh, a lot of people apply, applying for permits thought that it was taking a little too long. I'm just hoping that this is not going to be uh, overloading the ZBA. Probably not, but as I say, I just want to see if there's anybody remembers that same situation that I just alluded to. Nope. Okay, thanks. <laughs> huh? Huh? Okay, any, any else wish to speak to the article? Oh, Peter, I'm sorry. Mr. Fiore. Uh, Peter Fiore, Precinct 2. Um, I think I remember, and there are plenty of people here who can correct me if I'm wrong, but when we, when we uh, back in the 90s or whenever, uh, when we, we passed the bylaws that addressed wireless facilities, as a matter of public policy, uh, because they're a good source of revenue, we were going to try to steer these sites to uh, nonprofits, churches, town buildings. And so my question here is, uh, whether the redevelopment board isn't in a better position working with the, the town, town planners to, to do that. I don't, I don't see that happening if all these uh, wireless folks have to do is just go to the ZBA for a permit. And especially in a time when revenue is tight, I'm just, I'm just wondering if that's possible as a matter of public policy to, to try to steer them uh, more towards town buildings by working with the redevelopment board. So if I've made any sense, can anybody answer that question? Mr. Kowalski, does the redevelopment board have a, such a policy? Well, Mr. Fitzsimmons is going to answer your question. I will attempt to answer your question. Um, I don't believe that uh, 
the board to which one applies has any control over how the application uh, or the applicant selects the property. You're certainly right that um, nonprofit organizations such as churches have made uh, money leasing out uh, uh, bell towers and uh, steeples uh, to cell phone coverage providers and that the town has made money. But uh, I don't think that whether the ZBA is acting on these permits or the ARB would make any difference in terms of where the applicant goes. And I, I, I have one more question. Uh, is an applicant perhaps more likely to go to the town planner if they know they're going to have to go before the redevelopment board than, than if they have to go before the ZBA in order to get the town planner's input as to where a good location might be? On special permit applications before the ZBA, the uh, planning department will often uh, comment on those applications. So I think in terms of the voice of the planning department, again, it doesn't really matter if one's applying to the ZBA or to the ARB. You're going to get the input of the planning department. Thank you. Thank you. Anybody else wish to address the article? Sir, Mr. McCorry. Uh, Hugh McCrory, Precinct uh, 20. Uh, my understanding on what we were asked to vote here is we're dropping a bylaw uh, based on uh, for the permitting of these, uh, these communication facilities. I'm not clear why. Can someone speak to me why we had the bylaw in the first place and why we're dropping it? And I'm also not that familiar with the ZBA, so I apologize for that. My understanding is that it's a Board of Appeals for uh, planning applications, so I'm not quite following why... Uh, so I guess it's really background. Why, why we had the bylaw in the first place, which is maybe a historical uh, question, and why we're dropping it. Okay, so Bruce, why was there initially a special permit under the um, ARB, and now the ARB doesn't want to do this anymore, wants the ZBA to do it? Thank you. Uh, the original uh, part of the bylaw that made this a special permit to, uh, to the ARB uh, actually predates my involvement in town government, so I can't really answer that part of the question for you. Um, but uh, I would respond to the other part of your question. I don't think that this is a matter where we're dropping the bylaw. We're just transferring jurisdiction to the Zoning Board of Appeals. And the Zoning Board of Appeals can currently hear special permit applications. The difference between whether or not it's going to the ZBA or the ARB depends on whether there are a number of triggers. Some of them are geographic. Some of them are the, uh, the, the type of building, the size of the building. Uh, in general, larger um, uh, property developments on Massachusetts Avenue and Broadway and Pleasant Street are going to the ARB. Others would go to the Zoning Board of Appeals. What's different in the two applications is the environmental design review that you'll see in Section 11.06 of the bylaw. It's a much more involved special permit application if you're going to the ARB for environmental design review. Something further, Mr. McCoy? So uh, we're, not, um, we're not dropping a bylaw, but we're amending it by dropping a subsection of the bylaw. Is that correct? True. Correct? Yes. Okay. Thank you. Thank you. Anything else? Anyone else wish to speak? Okay. <clears throat> we have for us the recommended vote of the ARB is printed in your um, recommended report. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. Okie dokie. Two thirds vote. Uh, all in favor, please stand. Same tellers. Mahan, 12 up front, 12.
Mr. Schlickman. 37. 37 to my left. Mr. O'Connor. 44. 44 left center. Mr. Trembley. 34. 34 right center. Mr. McCabe. 41. 41. Okay, all in all opposed, please rise. Zero. 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 Four. Four. This is my cave. Zero. 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 Four. Zero. Hundred sixty-eight in the positive, four in the negative. It passes. That brings us to Article 9, Zoning Bylaw Amendment Minimum Lot Size. Mr. Fitzsimmons. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bruce Fitzsimmons, ARB. The recommended vote on Article 9 would change the Zoning Bylaw to make Section 6.06 .06 of the Zoning Bylaw pertaining to new construction on grandfathered lots more closely resemble the relevant portion of state law. This is a very technical amendment. I apologize to you in advance for having to read more than you might want me to. Um, uh, just at the outset, uh, for those of you who may not uh, take the zoning body law as your uh, nighttime uh, reading, uh, Article 6 sets forth dimensional and density regulations, where, whereas Article 9 pertains to non-conforming uses, structures, and lots. For the most part, these are very separate matters, but in some ways, there is some overlap and confusion that would result from the overlap. The purpose of this article is to remove one example of that confusion. The proposed amendment to section 6.06 .06 would strike the second sentence that pertains to reconstructing a house on an undersized lot and limit section 6.06 .06 to undersized lots that have never been built upon. If you're wondering what to do about reconstructing a house on an undersized lot, that's where you look to Article 9. So what we're doing is we're restricting Article 6 to only instances where the lot has not been built on previously. Has revised, Section 6.06 .06 would allow the new construction of one and two family residential dwellings on lots in existence as of 1924, provided that the new dwellings meet certain requirements. Three of those requirements are already in section 6.06. .06. Namely, that the lot must have at least 5,000 square, excuse me, 50,000 square feet of land, must have 5,000, that's right the first time. Thank you. What do you think this is, Winchester? That would be a radical <laughs> Let's try that again. 5,000 square feet of land. It must have 50 feet of frontage, and it must meet Arlington's open space requirements. This article would add one new requirement and modify an existing requirement. The new requirement would be that the undersized lot must not have been held in common ownership. That's coming directly from Chapter 40A, Section 6. And that it would need to meet the dimensional requirements under the 1975 zoning bylaw. What we're taking out is that seven and a half foot, or the greater of the seven and a half foot, or 15% of frontage setback requirement. That's actually in the 1975 bylaw. What we're doing is we're saying it's not just one dimensional requirement that would need to be met. You have to meet the requirements of the 1975 bylaw, all of them. Um, So in summary, the point of this article is not to deprive applicants of the ability to reconstruct existing structures on undersized lots, but to more clearly direct them to the provisions of Article 9 and to narrow the focus of Article 6 to undeveloped undersized lots in a way that more closely conforms to state zoning law. Thank you. Mr. Jameson. Uh, Gordon Jamerson, Precinct 12. Uh, I think I understand this, but uh, 
Actually, my half block provides several examples that I'd like some responses to, if possible, Mr. Moderator. So there's a nice uh, elderly woman who lives across the street who's retired, and I'm pretty sure that her lot is like 40 frontage at 4,000, something like that. And so what I heard was that if her house were to, for someone, I'm not wishing this on her, she's Anne, such a sweet woman, if her house were need, for, were need to be rebuilt or someone moved in there and wished to rebuild it, that would be okay under these changes. Fitzsimmons. That would be addressed pursuant to Article 9. In my opinion, that would be okay if it met okay. the requirements under Article okay. 9. I also have several neighbors, it, it turns out, that have um, uh, vacant, unbuildable lots contingent, con, uh, contiguous to their lot upon which they have their primary abode, single-family home. And if I understand this correctly, if those, those lots were large enough to meet this requirement, they could now be built on, or the, the, or the contiguous space, even if registered with the assessor as a separate piece of land, would prevent building? If it were an undersized lot? Um, if it was an undersized lot, I, I think it probably wouldn't be able to be built. But if it was contiguous to an existing home owned by the same owners and it was made this um, 50 and 5,000, would that be buildable? Um, if I understand the question correctly, if it's, a, if it's held in common ownership, it would not be entitled to be... To be okay, so in other words, if the same people own it, then they can't do that? That's correct. Okay, and then it turns out that the... Um, house I live in um, was originally um, in the middle of three 40-foot, 4,000-square-foot um, parcels, which were the old zoning in the Heights portion that I live up near uh, Brackett School. Um, the builder purchased my house, moved it over, and subdivided the land into two 60 by 6,000 square foot, which I believe is the current requirement. Would that still be able to be done? That would be done. Uh, be able to be done because that would be has a right because they're meeting. The okay, that, that, this perfect. has been very helpful to understand the, the different things so that someone can rebuild the under the non-conforming or lots even with this size that are owned by the same owner could not be built unless they were the sixty to six thousand, and then the, the subdivision pro problem that um, allows me to live in my house and someone to have a nicer house next door um, it could still be done. Thank you. Oh, thank you. The climate. Thank you, Mr. Marley. Stuart Kleinman, Precinct 1. Uh, it was just mentioned about a seven and a half foot setback. If my memory serves me right, we as a town meeting enacted a 20 foot setback as a requirement a few years back. How does this article affect that? Because it seems that seven and a half foot would supersede the 20 foot. This article would have no effect on the 20-foot uh, setback. We're only talking about if you have, you'd still have to comply with the 1975 zoning bylaw requirement. That requirement has, with respect to side yard setbacks, the greater of 7.5 feet or 15% of the frontage has your side yard setback. So, okay, so the 7.5 foot is side, not front. Is that correct? That's correct, on the side, yes. All right, thank you. Mr. McCabe? Thank you, Mr. Howard. I'm Howard McCabe, Precinct 21. Same question in the first sentence. I think if we add an S to the word vote, we'll, we'll yeah, fix that. Administrative changes here by me. Right, and I think the next article is the same. Article 10, the same. Thank you. Yep, I'll make that administrative article through Thank the you. ARB and I'll scold them next year. Don't do it again. <laughs> um, Ms. Broadman. Thank you, Ms. McKay, for pointing that out. Janice Broadman, Precinct, precinct 15. Um, I also have a question. So if, um, if, a, if, if a parcel is, has been built on, there's a structure there, but someone wanted to 
let's say, widen a driveway or make some other change within that parcel, is, that, is the ability to do that changed by this uh, article? In other words, if you're going to make a change and it's, it's, it's outside of the structure, because as I understand the article, as long as you're staying within the structure, there's really no change. But if you wanted to change something outside, let's say someone had a garden and they decided to take a foot of that garden and widen their driveway. Would that be prohibited by this? Ms. Fitzsimmons? No, this article would have no effect on widening your driveway or moving, taking a foot from your garden. Thank you. Okay, anybody else wish to speak to the article? Mr. Lyman, Judd. Lyman, Judd, Precinct 9. I wonder if the uh, redevelopment board has a ballpark figure of how many lots would be affected by this and is it, up to this point has it been a potential problem. I know that more than a few times developers have found some loopholes somewhere to get around. That's why we have a couple of houses built in the middle of a, what was a right of way for a street. So I'm just wondering if uh, you have an idea of how much effect this will have on the whole town or any particular neighborhood. Ms. Kowalski, do you have an estimate of the number of lots this will actually affect? Carol Kowalski, Director of Planning Community Development. Uh, the short answer is no, we don't have. The Redevelopment Board or the Planning Department has a total number of non-conforming lots unbuilt in Arlington. Relly, do you know that? No. No one seems to know your answer. Okay. Is the gentleman back here standing next to the gentleman with the mic? Yep. Okay. Uh, Kevin Mills, Precinct 1. I'm um, uh, wondering if there'll be any grace period if this is passed. I think it'll take effect upon passage. Her troop? Will the whole Rice will take effect upon passage and approval by the state? Would there be any grace period following? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Juliana Rice, Town Council. Uh, zoning bylaw changes um, take effect the date they are advertised. So. Wait. Actually, it already has taken effect. Although there is a five-year grace period in the state law, that would apply only to lots of 7,500 square feet or larger. It would not apply to lots between 5,000 and 7,500 square feet. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak to the article? Seeing none, ready for a vote. Zoning bylaw, we need a two-thirds vote. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. All opposed, say no. No. Okay, okay. All in favor, please rise. Sam Keller. <laughs> Ms. Mahan. <laughs> ten. Up front, ten. <laughs> Mr. Schlickman, 33, my left, 33. Mr. O'Connor, 44, left center. Mr. Trembley, 37, right center. Mr. McCabe, 40. Four zero on the right. All opposed, please rise. Two. Two up front. Mr. Schlickman? Four. Four. Left. Four. Mr. Zero. Zero. Mr. O'Connor. Mr. Trembley? Three. Three. Mr. McCabe? Three. Three. Three.
166 in the affirmative, 12 in the negative, it passes. Well, that brings us to Article 10. It's only by law amendment floodplain district inland wetland. You know, change the floodplains, Mr. Fitzsimmons. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Uh, Article 10 is really designed to economize the process for an applicant who would be before the ARB on a special permit uh, with environmental design review and whose project will have an impact on floodplain districts or inland wetland districts. Under the current version of sections 11.04 and 11.05, the Zoning Board of Appeals has exclusive jurisdiction for hearing applications for special permits involving floodplains and wetlands. This is the case even if the applicant is before the ARB with respect to every other aspect of their proposal. What we're trying to do here is to save the applicant from having to go back and forth between two boards on essentially the same project. This in some ways we believe is a housekeeping type of measure designed to give the applicant uh, the ability to focus all their arguments up with one forum instead of going back and forth. Mr. McCabe. Thank you, Mr. Mayor. Mayor McCabe, Precinct, and um, same question. Yep, we're going to add the SC. Add an S to the word vote. I think we'll take care of it. Thank you. Administratively. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak to this article? Ms. Fiore. Elsie Fiore, Precinct 2. Uh, I'm sorry, I didn't really have uh, time to read this article, but I'm confused. Where does the uh, Conservation Commission on wetlands hearings come in on this? Does or this, do they? Does this affect the Conservation Commission's right to hear these kind of issues? It does not. So they would still need to go before the Conservation Commission. Thank you. Thank you. Anyone else wish to speak to the article? Mr. Judd. Yeah. No, you have to wait. Lyman. Lyman, I got the, I got the standard. Yeah. Now, Lyman, Judd, Precinct 9. To follow up on Mr. McCabe, if we need to correctly phrase this, right now it says to see if the town will vote to amend, should the word will be removed? No, no, no. That's the, our, that's the, that's the warrant. You're looking at the recommended vote printed in the ARB report, which reads that the town votes to amend. Don't look at the warrant, look at the recommended vote in the report. That's so what I'm looking at. That's what I'm looking at here, sir. Can't be. To see if the town will vote, because we added the S, to I'm amend. Is that the town votes. Is that the town vote yeah. Oh, okay, thank yeah. you. Look down further down, it says vote. You're, I think you're looking at the wrong thing, buddy. Anyone else wish to speak to the article? Okay. Zoning bylaw amendment to third vote. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. All opposed, say no. No. Okay, okay. Standing vote once again. Front. Mahan reports 12. Mr. Schlickman. 35 on the left. Oops. Mr. 44, left center. 38, right center. Mr. McCabe. 38. Okay, all opposed, please rise. <laughs> Ms. Mahan? Zero. Mr. Schickman? Zero. Mr. O'Connor? 
Zero. Mr. Tremblay, one. Mr. McCabe, zero. zero. Oh, Mr. McCabe, you got one way in the back there. I believe you. Thank you. So we're going we're to count them. One sixty seven to two. It passes. That ends Article ten. Now we go to Article eleven. Zoning bylaw amendment flood plains protection. From what I can tell, we're substituting one set of words for another. Is that about it, Ms. Kowalski? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. I'm Carol Kowalski, Director of Planning and Community Development. Uh, yes, this warrant article would restore to the bylaw a very clear prohibition against construction in the floodplain that existed in our bylaw until last town meeting. Uh, last year at town meeting, uh, town meeting was asked to adopt the new flood insurance rate maps and in the process, the, the state provided us with a model bylaw for doing that and it wasn't considered that by adding some of their text, it was creating a little bit of a gray area and an internal inconsistency that could have been interpreted as allowing construction of the floodway under certain conditions, which it does not. So you'll see that we're changing, this, this vote would change the reference to the maps used to the flood insurance rate maps, and it would delete a section that created this internal Inconsistency. Thank you. Okie dokie. Anybody have any questions regarding this? Yes, we're going to make that administrative, uh, that section, blah, blah, blah. It doesn't say the word votes on this one, so we don't have to change it. Anybody wish to speak to this article? Hey, hey, look, dude, if you want to talk, you've got to stand up and introduce yourself. You can't just yell. It's not saving time. Lyman Judd, Precinct 9. On page 10, when you go down after the initial two paragraphs, the next thing says vote, colon. And it's that section that, that uh, it doesn't say voted that the town ha is, does, or didn't. Doesn't need to. Ms. Rice, can you el elucidate further? on the correctness of the vote. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Juliana Rice, Town Council. I happen to have written this one, so this one is perfect. <laughs> Thank you, Ms. Rice. Thank you. I'm hoping that that will stand up in court. <laughs> Mr. Smith. Smith Precinct 5, just a quick question. Firms is an acronym. Is that an acronym? What does it mean? Yeah, what does firms mean? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Juliana Rice Town Council. FIRM stands for Flood Insurance Rate Map, and it is defined earlier in the existing bylaw, I believe. Yes. Answer your question? Okay, anybody else wish to speak to the article? Seeing none, we have before us a recommended vote of the ARB is printed in the report. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. All opposed, say no. All ready. Everybody stand up who wants to vote for it. All in favor, please rise. Ms. Mahan, 12 up front in favor. Mr. Schlickman, 34 to the left. Mr. O'Connor, 44. 
Mr. Trembley. 40. 40 to the right center. Mr. McCabe. 41. All opposed, please rise. That'd be one. Zero. 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 Mr. McCabe. One. One. Passes by a whole bunch to one. Let's count it. Twelve. Thirty-four. Forty-four. Forty? Hundred and seventy one to one. Okay, that brings us to Article twelve. Zoning bylaw wetland and floodplain overlay map. We found a new pond. We did. Uh, Mike Kerr, Arlington Hold on, wait a second. Uh, we're going to administratively add the S. <laughs> I would also like to say that next year, I think we've all agreed over here quickly that Ms. Rice will be involved in every single one of the votes. Yeah. <laughs> Just um, what you wanted. Article 12 is something that a uh, town meeting uh, runs into uh, from time to time. And uh, what it is, is it's adding. Um, the purpose of the Warren article was to add two properties to the um, wetland and floodplain overlay. And the two properties were Ryder Brook uh, behind 15 Ryder Street and the wetland and screen behind 86 Coolidge Road. Uh, this was submitted by the Conservation Committee. Uh, they had uh, designated these two parcels as known wetlands that already meet the state standards on the overlay map. Um, it had come to the inclusion of the known wetlands on the overlay serves to alert the public and the building inspector to the presence of the protected wetlands. Um, it has since come to the attention of the article since the article was put forth that Ryder Street was actually included in the 2004 vote of town meeting, it but was subsequently uh, and inadvertently not added to the map. So that will be done, and therefore Ryder Street, uh, it, the parcel behind 15 Ryder Street is no longer included in the ARP's recommended vote. Uh, 86 Coolidge Road uh, does have, as you can see, a stream running down to it, uh, or through it, uh, right down into that little uh, pond right there. Um, known wetland, uh, and we would wish to put it on the map as, um, as documented in the map that's in the, uh, is in the recommended vote. Um, and that's it. Mr. Schlickman. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. Do the owners of the Saki property know that we're talking about them tonight? Uh, the answer is I, I don't know. Um, the fact is, is that this does not change any of the responsibilities that a landowner has to its property or anything else. It's simply designated on the map a known weapon. Um, the, the rights and responsibilities of the property owner is not in any way changed by the fact that it's put on the map. <laughs> and to answer your question, they have been provided with the warrant. They've been duly warned. They know what they're talking about if they need it. That's why we send warrants to everyone. Um, Mr. Rector. Mr. Rector. Uh, Bruce Welchel, uh, Precinct uh, 12. And, uh, uh, the abutting property owner to the uh, property in question, uh, uh, the moderator gave the correct answer. Yes, everyone knows about it. Thank you, Mr. Well. Mr. Judd. Well, I'm in Judd Precinct 9. It seems to me that establishing this flood area or a pond, whatever it is, could affect what the property owner could do with the property, if I am not mistaken, because I believe, say, the Congress Conservation Commission and others could uh, go to court against him and say that he is violating the flood plan. Now, I, I could be wrong on this, but there have been many cases throughout the United States where a snail diver put something completely out of uh, control and uh, stopped a federal project. So some could dart in and ruin his day? 
Can you answer his question? I'm not sure about the salamanders, but as far as uh, putting the uh, wetland, the known wetland, on the map does not change the rights or responsibilities of that property owner at all. It simply puts it on the map. Thank you. Uh, I'm not trying to quibble, Mr. Moderator, but excuse me, this is not a swipe at Ms. Rice, please. It says vote that the town votes to amend. Aren't we supposed to have consistency because all of these articles have to go before the Attorney General's office for approval, and I don't know if they would be uh, upset by not having the same enabling words. I mean, I think we all know what is intended by these articles, but if we need to conform to a specific format to get these approved by the state, I don't know if we have to do this or not. It would work either way. I talked to Mr. Smith. Would it work either way, Ms. Rice? Thank you, Mr. Moderator, Juliana Rice, Town Council. In my defense, I didn't write this one. Um, <laughs> but yeah, it would work either way. Thank you. Um, Mr. Weddle, second time. Uh, Bruce Wells, Old Precinct 12, second time. Um, in answer to Mr. Judd's uh, question, the, the property owners uh, went before the Conservation Commission um, a year ago uh, and had an environmental consultant that produced a very uh, thick and thorough study. No endangered species um, were found or listed uh, in, the, uh, uh, in, in the consultant's uh, report. They are not endangered. Their wallets may be. <laughs> Thank you. Mr. Smith. Dick Smith, Precinct 17. Mr. Moderator, you agreed to make administrative corrections to all of the articles except the perfect one that was prepared by the town council. Could you also make an administrative change to all of the other articles to bring them into the same format as the article drafted by the town council so there is, an internal, in, there is internal consistency and there will be no change in the meaning? No. Uh, basically, they, they would have to be rewritten in order to become to the same format and I'm not going to sit here and rewrite all of these articles right now on the fly. Ms. Rice's opinion is that they will all um, pass state muster and that they're good as they are, as long as we add that S. Mr. Schlickman, you want to say something for a second time? Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9, motion to terminate debate on all matters under this article. Second. Okay. All in favor of terminating debate, please say yes. Yes. All opposed say no. Nope, it is terminated. Okay, we have before us a recommended vote of the ARB as printed in their report with the administrative S. All in favor, please rise. I'm going to have you rise because someone's going to say no. Miss Mahan? Twelve. Mr. Schlickman? 30. 30. 30 to the left. Strattery, 44. 44, left center. Thank you, Mr. O'Connor. Mr. Trembley? 39. 39, right center. Mr. McCabe? 42. 42, on the right. Okay, all, all opposed, please rise. <laughs> you knew that was going to happen. No, nope. that's okay, I'll look foolish. I don't care. All right, 167 in the affirmative, zero in the negative. It's unanimous vote, we've got a nice constant vote on it anyways. All righty, yep. yes sir. Precinct two, 
Uh, I'd like to, I, I don't know the proper procedure, but I'd like to take Article 22 out of order and present it next, please. Um, I'm going to ask you not to do that for one reason. The town meeting procedure committee is meeting Thursday on this article to give you our recommended vote. We have an internal debate going whether or not the wording here will pass muster with the AG, and we want to finalize that before we present. We're either going to go with what the Board of Selectmen wrote or a little bit different language. Where it has to do with how the original bylaws was passed that allowed me to declare a unanimous vote, and we want to be able to make sure it works. But I'll, I appreciate your thoughts. I will withdraw it. Thank you. Thank you. For what purpose do you rise, Mr. Marquis? Take the microphone's right there. Okay. I think we have kind of a stereotypical system here. Does, do you know the meaning of the word stereotypical? Sir, we're not going to debate a, a, a Essentially, that. either or. What is your point, sir? My point is it doesn't seem like we have any directions to go in. There are many people who don't vote sometimes That's their because own prerogative. We are going they, they know they're very smart people who do very good research but oftentimes they don't understand things one man told me that only a small percentage of people really knew what was going on and that okay, that's the way it sir. always <laughs> is that listen, listen. is the way I think it always is listen. have Every, a good day everyone has a right to speak I ask them to speak. They don't want to speak. That's their, that's their prerogative. If they don't ask a question, we can't answer it. So we're going from number one to number 76. That's the route we're going. So I'm not sure what you're talking about. So we're on number 13. ARB recommended vote of no action. All in favor of no action, please say yes. Yes. All opposed? No action. Number 14. Dude, it's no action. <laughs> Article 14, Zoning Bylaw Amendment, Affordable Housing Requirements, Definition of Units. Mr. Fitzsimmons. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Bruce Fitzsimmons, ARB. Article 14 was one of a trio of articles uh, submitted at the request of a town manager. Uh, we believe that we have wrapped all three of those articles into one and that article 14 is the one. What this would do essentially is to remove assisted housing living facilities from affordable housing requirements. Uh, it has come to our attention that assisted living uh, it typically combines the cost of housing and the cost of care in a way that is such that you can't unscramble the egg and break them apart easily. So what we would be sub requiring the developer who is proposing assisted living to do would be to be subsidizing the care element in addition to the housing element. Um, and un under our current zoning bylaw, we feel that if we did not provide relief in this area, assisted living facilities simply would not be built. Thank you. Anyone wish to address the article? Anyone have any questions? Okay. All in favor, please say yes. Yes. All opposed, say no. It's a unanimous vote, and I so declare it. Amazing. All right, brings us to Article 15. Recommended vote of the ARB is no action. No sub any substitutes? Seeing none. All in favor of no action, please say yes. Yes. All opposed, say no. No action. Article 16, recommended vote of the ARB is no action. Any substitutes? Seeing none, all in favor of no action, please say yes. Yes. All opposed, say no. No action. Article 17, zoning bylaw amendment, outdoor advertising at Pierce Field. Who's going to speak to this? Okay. Um, Mike Kerr, Arlington Redevelopment Board. Um, 
Article 17, uh, the purpose of this warrant article is to allow temporary signs at the high, high school athletic fields to raise additional funds for the schools. Um, after, long, uh, after very careful uh, consideration, uh, we have come up with a, a bylaw that we think addresses um, what's required for these signs to be uh, placed uh, at the Pierce Field area. Uh, what you'll see is that the signs um, that we are uh, looking to, um, we are looking to have the, the school department uh, approach us uh, for a uh, signage plan uh, for the area that would need a special permit. Um, the signs would be required to have uh, the a graphical symbol of the high school being sponsored as well as it could have either the name or the uh, trademark of the sponsor. Um, we would uh, approve the signage plan applications to ensure the overall design of the signs to be um, put forth in the plan and um, to make sure that it meets uh, the standards that we've, we've set for the special permit process. Um, this article was uh, put forth uh, by a 10 registered voter initiative. Um, it has the unanimous support of the Athletic Advisory Committee, uh, uh, of the School Athletic Advisory Committee, and it also has the support of the school committee. Um, the school committee will be in charge, uh, I'm sorry, the school department, uh, either through the superintendent of the school committee, will be in charge of coming up with the guidelines for the signs, but we expect them to be very limited in scope with the, with the graphical name of the high school as well as either the name or the trademark of the sponsor. So we believe this is a good bylaw um, to help in, this, in the current situation, and I think as a board we believe that it's nothing that other uh, areas are doing at their own fields. So, Mr. Leonard. Thank you, Mr. Moderator. John Leonard, Precinct 17. I'm curious about these signs in regards to when and if damage was done to the sign. Whose responsibility would it be to repair it? And second part of the question is, we all know about tagging in the town. What's going to be the decision made in regards to tagging? Does the person responsible for the sign have a certain period of time to replace that sign after it's been tagged? Sir? So, Don't with resp oh, sorry, Mike Kerr, Arlington Redevelopment Board. Um, so, in respect of uh, the signs themselves, I should have also mentioned that the temporary nature of the signs is around the uh, fact that they will be uh, more focused on the seasons where uh, play will uh, happen down there. So, uh, they're going to have uh, they're going to be up between March 15th and December 1st of each calendar year. So from what you were talking about with respect to tagging and the like, there's no difference with these signs than any other signs that are in town. If something gets tagged, it's going to be subject to the different requirements of removal of uh, graffiti, et cetera, um, by the, um, uh, by the, by the uh, governing board, which I guess would be the school department in this case. What I'm getting at is that, if I'm not mistaken, if a place in Arlington is tagged, I think we passed the requirement that said they had a certain period of time in order to replace that tagging, eliminate it, paint it over or whatever, or they would face some, some kind of a fine. I'm wondering if Joe's Hardware puts up a sign down here and that sign gets tagged, say in the middle of the night or something, is Joe's Hardware responsible to replace that with a brand new sign or does somebody come in and say don't worry about it? It's all covered under this particular article. I think Mr. Sullivan wants to um, answer yeah, that question. Well. Uh, yes, the bylaw provides that the owner of the property is responsible for removing the tagging. In this case, it would be the town responsible for that. Uh, so whether it's a plain fence out there or it happens to be advertising on the fence, it would be the town's responsibility to remove that tagging. So again, the town would be under the the requirement to fulfill a certain period of time. I'm not sure what the time is, but the tagging or the sign would have to be replaced? Correct. And it will be at the town's expense? Yes. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Leonard. Mr. Streifeld? Yes. Ms. Simon? Yes. 
Leba, hi, I'm Precinct 11. Um, I rise in support of this article as both a town meeting member and a school committee member. Um, this is something a lot of other communities have invested in as a way of um, invigorating funding into their athletic departments. Um, in addition, they would be the, the signage that we've been looking at would be tasteful. It would emphasize the high school um, athletic program with the advertiser's name as a secondary component. And um, the school committee and the school department is committed to supporting this and keeping it part of the Arlington beautification process. So we see it as a visual asset to the field in addition to a financial asset to our sporting teams. Thank you. Thank you. The woman in the back. Yep. Yeah. Hey, Michael, uh, Precinct 18. Um, yeah, that mic sounds funny. <laughs> Does this one work? Oh, work. yes, that one's functioning. Um, I, I just wanted to note, um, oh, Pam Heidel, uh, Precinct 18. I just wanted to note that um, a proposal was before the Arlington Zoning Board of Appeals um, last month, and the Zoning Board of Appeals did uh, vote approval. Um, but all that aside, I just was wondering, is it spot zoning to designate um, just signs? And I'm, I'm for raising money. Don't. Don't get me wrong, but is it spot zoning to designate signs in just one specific area? Ms. Rice, do you care to opine? <laughs> Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Juliana Rice, Town Council. <clears throat> I wasn't asked for my input on this draft bylaw, and I actually see a number of potential problems with it. Um, the, I, the concept of spot zoning being one of them. It may be that it could be argued that it's really just an exemption of a town instrumentality from the town zoning bylaw, but generally zoning bylaws are done by district. Sign bylaws do not have to be in the zoning bylaw, but in Arlington they are. And generally uh, zoning is done by district, not by property. So I would say that's a potential issue. I don't know if the Attorney General would reject the, the zoning bylaw on that ground. Thank you. Mr. Good. Uh, my name is David Good. I'm a uh, town meeting member from Precinct 13. I'm the secretary of the uh, Arlington Athletic Advisory Committee. So I'm not sure which podium I should uh, uh, speak to you at. If I'm the CTO, I'll be over there. If I'm a, a town meeting member, I'll be here. I'll go over there if I'm the secretary of the advisory committee. Uh, <laughs> but the three of us will stay right here for now. Uh, I'd like to rise in support of this article. Um, the advisory committee uh, is a uh, uh, sponsored committee of the Arlington School Committee and uh, we've been working together for the past three or four months to look for solutions uh, to offset athletic fees. You know, the athletic budget is a half a million dollars which is passed to the parents uh, in the form of a fee. And uh, our, our goal uh, as, as, as uh, committee members and the school committee is to make sure that every uh, high school student uh, in the town, uh, in the Arlington High School, uh, can participate uh, in a sport, uh, whether it be intramural or, or varsity JV, and, and not be burdened uh, with uh, the inability to raise money and, and, and actually uh, have that be a detriment to the, the individual. Um, the, the article uh, talks about uh, tasteful signs, and, and I think that this is the key. We're not looking to make this billboard haven. Uh, the, the, we are in the process of uh, interviewing vendors. Uh, we're, we're writing an RFP uh, to include both language of the Zoning Board of Appeals and uh, the uh, Redevelopment uh, Board, and uh, we have uh, made it uh, a very, very high priority to make sure that um, this does not become uh, untasteful or mismanaged. Uh, our goal uh, is, is to have, um, uh, once we choose a vendor, which would be to have that vendor be responsible for uh, maintenance, upkeep, actually installing the, uh, the banners, et cetera. So uh, 
Thanks very much for your time. I just would like your support on this article. Thank you, Mr. Thank you, Mr. Good. Mr. Schlickman. Paul Schlickman, Precinct 9. If I may ask the town council through you, Mr. Moderator, if uh, she had a couple of days and we voted this on Wednesday, would she be able to write this in a manner which would make it more survivable at the Attorney General? Ms. Rice? Thank you, Mr. Moderator. Juliana Rice, Town Council. I'm not sure how to answer that question because I haven't been asked to do that. Um, what's before town, town meeting is the redevelopment board's request for a particular vote. I would do it differently. There's your answer. That's an interesting answer. <laughs> I'm not sure if I'd move to postpone or to adjourn and let's see if something might happen that would be a little more survivable. Uh, do you have an opinion, Mr. Moderator, of which motion you'd like me to offer? We have seven good minutes left. <laughs> I motion to postpone this article to time certain Wednesday. Um, no. Because if we're coming up with a substitute. Okay, then we have to go. I'm, okay, then I will move to postpone this article for time certain next Monday. Okay. Do I, second? Second. Okay, all in favor of postponing this till next Monday, please say yes. Yes. Opposed, say no. No. Okay, it is postponed. Move adjourn. <laughs> all right, got a motion to adjourn. All in favor? Yes. Opposed? No. Oh, gee whiz. <laughs> All right. If we're going to waste five minutes every night. We'll be here forever. We'll see you on Wednesday. And oh, by the way, we are governed by town meeting time. If anyone wants a copy, bring a check for $25 made out to Mass Moderators Association next Monday. Mass Moderators Association, 25 bucks. Thank you. See you on Wednesday.